Great. Thank you, Todd, so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. My name is Morgan Wood. I'm head of community here at Hive Bright, and Todd Nielsen from Clock Tower Advisors is joining us. Todd, can you give us a quick introduction? Hi, Morgan. Thank you so much. I've been excited about this all week, at, at least all week, at probably the last couple of weeks uh, that this has been coming up. Um, I run a company called Clock Tower Advisors, which is a consulting organization. I do strategy uh, for mainly B2B and nonprofit organizations, uh, mid-sized to large around uh, building thriving online communities or digital workplaces internally for organizations. I've been running the company since 2015. I've been involved in the community space since a ways before that. Uh, and uh, I, I love community building because I think it's the most fun you can have with the internet. Oh my gosh, never a truer statement. I am so excited about this conversation with you today, Todd. It's going to be fantastic. So without further ado, let's first uh, get uh, familiar with our audience today. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. Fantastic. So um, we went through registration uh, here on Hivebrite and we have more than 20 countries represented today. So hello everyone. And we're across industries and experience today as well. So we have community managers, marketing managers, founders, program managers, customer success managers, um, and even more titles than that. So welcome everyone. Um, like Todd and I already touched on, we have an expertise in community building. And today we're going to be talking to you about how we can integrate AI into community building. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So the central question today, um, are, well, we have two, Todd. It's first, what is AI? And second, how are we going to put AI and community building together? And I know you're really passionate about this topic and all of your resources you've generated so far in the community building space have been wonderful. So we're so excited to have you here today to help us start to dissect this. So do you think it would be best to maybe start with a general definition of AI and then we can start to break down community building alongside it? Yeah, absolutely, Morgan. Um, yeah, and thank you for that for that setup. Um, yeah, art, artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want to spend too long on this, and uh, I don't want to go into an academic dissertation on it either because I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, and I want to preface all this by saying that that yes, I am passionate about this topic. I am and have been throughout my career a what I would characterize as an early adopter. And I'm always trying to look at new things. I don't characterize myself as an expert uh, on these issues. I think I'm, I, I always say I'm an interested amateur uh, and always learning and always looking to learn. And it's one of the reasons I look forward to events like this, because people will always bring up ideas or uh, technologies that I haven't heard of yet, um, even as much as I try to stay up on, on what's happening in a given space. AI or artificial intelligence for short is... Uh, something that involves uh, a lot of different technologies, but uh, essentially has this ability to bring together uh, large language models and apply learning and uh, algorithms to it um, so that we can get meaningful outputs. I think a lot of what we're thinking of right now in terms of AI are what I would consider generative language models um, or generative uh, AI, which is for creating images based on text prompts or uh, or like really crunching down and building uh, on uh, data sets of information to write a blog or to analyze content or to do something uh, interesting, you know, uh, and creative, like have, you know, collaborative storytelling uh, kind, kinds of uh, uses for these things. So it really does incorporate an awful lot. Um, I think what it's not right now, uh, although it's got the opportunity from everything that I read and hear uh, from people that are experts in the field to become more generalized uh, artificial intelligence. And so generalized AI is definitely a different matter. Um, and that's something that's more approaching human intelligence sort of levels and performance with things. I think we may be a year or two off from that, uh, but we are definitely moving in a direction where uh, our AI buddies who are here to help us with work um, will be better partners as we go forward. And hopefully we do that in ethical and smart ways as we develop this, this kind of tech. 
Yeah, absolutely. And oh, Mary and to clarify, Mary was asking that uh, is generative AI couple. No, we're we're using generative AI right now. Um, generalized AI. Uh, and, and I apologize if I misstep, misspoke. Um, ge generalized AI, which would be sort of a generalized intelligence. I think that's uh, some years off. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Mary, for calling out that question. If you have any questions about what Todd and I are talking about throughout this call, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, and we'll be sure to respond in real time. Um, so Todd, thank you so much for that overview. I think that gets us on you know, the same page. So when we're talking about uh, uh, AI today, we're talking more about uh, that creative side, that more of the generative element, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and and I am actually really curious. From the uh, the people attending, it sounds like uh, a number of the people who've chimed in so far are using or experimenting with uh, AI based tools, and I would love to get a sense of like uh, mm -hmm. if there are people in the audience who maybe haven't tried anything, they're using this as a way to maybe jump in and explore a little bit. Um, would love to hear from you in the comments as well if you if you haven't used AI yet. In fact, we actually, Todd and I put together a poll yesterday. So we're going to go ahead and we'll launch a poll and we're going to ask you about your experience with AI. Um, so the question is, have you used AI in community building yet? And it's ranging from, no, I haven't thought about it. No, I'm AI curious. Yes, I've used one or two tools or yes, I'm basically a manager of AI bots now. So go ahead and respond. We'll give it 20 more seconds. When we were talking through these options yesterday, I was saying uh, the uh, the yes, I'm a manager of AI bots. Now you guys cleaned it up nicely. I said, uh, yes, I, I look forward to serving my robot masters. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yes, we cleaned it up a little bit. I think there was a character count. All right, so oh. we're going to go ahead <laughs> and we'll end the poll. And we'll go ahead and share the results. So we're split between, yes, I've tried one or two and uh, no, but I'm curious. So this is a great session today for folks, both who have tried one or two tools. And then also for those who are curious, because Todd and I are going to walk through um, existing tools um, and different tips and strategies. So without further ado, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So, so this was was one of uh, the things that you just mentioned, Morgan, about like things that you can use. Uh, for me, I watch a lot of news about AI-based tools and what's out there. And what strikes me, or what I get frustrated with, is I'll 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 tune into a YouTuber that's talking about AI-based tools, and they'll tell you, oh, you've got to go to GitHub and download Python and install like. Generally speaking, I'm not as interested in those kinds of tools. Um, I'll call these out when I see them. I think there's one in my listing um, that I've that I provided around this, and I think we'll we'll have a link um, where you can download the uh, a PDF that kind of collects a lot of this information that, that Hivebright is so kindly put together uh, from from my handout around this. Um, but uh, as you start thinking about um, like the practical usage of AI tools for community building. There are, there are really kind of a couple of different ways in which I see that it can be applied. Um, one is definitely uh, elevating productivity and, and like just making your life a little bit easier uh, in terms of being a, a manager of community spaces, um, enhancing member experiences and, and engagement. So uh, just better ways to respond to people or um, having having a co-pilot to help you sort of write a difficult response to something that someone has said in a community space is so useful. Um, bots that can can respond uh, or react to uh, things that people say in the community um, and uh, and maybe offer helpful tips or flag uh, problematic content in some cases. Um, definitely there and making just better data driven decisions about things. Um, I know that in a, a lot of my day to day work in in uh, building strategies around online communities, I'll spend a lot of time interviewing members of a community or talking to internal stakeholders in an organization as they're thinking about uh, building a community. I am taking detailed notes um, from those conversations. I am employing my AI, my read.ai 
uh, a transcriber that gives me a note summary and what are the key topics that we had in that conversation and is doing sentiment analysis around it. And then what I'm generally doing now is I'm crunching those notes into a tool like ChatGPT and I'm asking it to take a look at multiple different interviews and pull out key affinitized topics around that. That was heavy labor for me um, in, in times past. And it saved me, it's, it's probably uh, made me four times as efficient um, now that I have uh, these tools to really be my data analyst uh, in, in a lot of different cases. Oh my gosh. And Todd, I can't really anymore other than the fact that the the amount of time that I used to spend in, anal in analysis of member responses or survey data or uh, member interviews, and then being able to concisely go through, get the key sentiment, get the key summary of the interview, and then create um, through chat GPT, uh, this larger understanding comparing each one has been such a time saver because <laughs> previously that would have taken weeks uh, for me to do by hand. Um, and so throughout this discussion, we're going to go ahead and we'll touch on these elements of community building. I saw a question in the chat about, you know, maybe I need to, uh, uh, they, uh, they were saying that I probably need to better understand what community building is. And so uh, Todd, feel free to build off of this too. Um, when we're talking about community building, it's, uh, I think one of those generalized terms where we say community building and Typically, it's falling within uh, this elevating productivity, streamlining operations, everything that's making your community tick. So it could be from writing emails to your members to posting uh, posts in your community and everything in between. Um, so as community professionals, we're really honing in on how can we use AI to help us become more efficient. So let's go ahead and start to dig a little deeper, Todd, um, and we'll jump over into our elevating productivity and streamlining operations. And we'll get started um, with the different tools that you outlined for good community experiments. So let's jump two slides forward. Perfect. So Todd, I took this from, uh, I took notes from you, uh, from the handbook that we'll uh, review in a little bit, but uh, these were the ones that caught my eye. And I would love for you to walk us through uh, maybe your three favorites here and how you're using them. And then I'll share different ways that I've been seeing them used with our customers um, and then also how I'm using them as well. Uh, absolutely. Um <clears throat> so, I mean, you, you have to acknowledge the gorilla in the room, uh, which uh, is uh, to say that ChatGPT is, of course, the start of what's become this tidal wave of AI-based tools that are out there. The fact that they've, they were able to get a generative language model going that is widely applicable to a lot of different uh, usages so widely applicable, applicable that I believe that it has really resulted in um, uh, really the emergence of an entire new industry or profession of people that are professional prompt builders. Like, how do I write a good prompt for ChatGPT, right? Um, and of course, uh, you know, Bing, uh, Microsoft being a backer of ChatGPT, it's now been fully integrated in their product. And now if you use the paid version of ChatGPT, um, they're basically turning on the web search version of that is actually clicking a box that says Bing on it. And so these are <laughs> these are now two very tightly integrated uh, kinds of tools. So I, I'll, I'll kind of name them as one as a, as a favorite to, to take a look at. Um, uh, you know, other tools that are related to copy creation would be like copy.ai, which is for creating, creating blog pieces or writing posts. Uh, for the community also, which, you know, ChatGPT is, is good for. Um, these things are only as good as the prompts that you give them. So thinking a little bit more about how you create, um, you know, good, um, good copy. Uh, it's got everything to do with the input that you give it, the direction that you give it, and uh, really subsequent revisions that you ask it for um, through that process. Um, the other ones that uh, I'll mention, uh, somebody was asking about Search Unify. Search Unify is a very broad-based product. Um, it is actually intelligent search, uh, so it uses AI-based tools, and it actually this this is of all these on here. This Search Unify is actually built for communities, 
and it is um, it, it is well integrated with Koros, uh, if any of you use that particular product, um, as well as uh, Vanilla. Uh, I think it also goes. I think it also integrates with um, with Higher Logic, um, and can probably be integrated with a variety of other platforms if you've got good APIs uh, built in. What Search Unify is really good at doing is. Um, helping you to identify the content that you want to um, really place better when somebody searches for content. Um, it'll help you search across uh, a little bit more of a federated search, but um, but it'll help you search across useful uh, content. It's also got some AI bots built into it um, to help people who prefer to get their help through a chat bot you know, instead. And so um, it's a pretty powerful, more comprehensive kind of platform. And and so you need to uh, evaluate, you know, what's right for your organization. But uh, that that's really, I think, like truly, the, you know, one of the enterprise packages that's available out there for that. Um, Checkstep, I also like, like quite a lot um, because um, it is designed for uh, large, like Reddit scale kinds of or uh, kinds of communities and organizations. Um, it's for content moderation. In fact, and so uh, check my my involvement. Check step, check step is actually a partner of mine. My involvement with working with them uh, goes back before the Chat GPT craze. Um, they have a tool that can evaluate text and images and and audio uh, for moderation purposes. So it can flag anything that is problematic content uh, automatically, um, and it will then also work with the community manager to identify. Uh, ones that need a little more of a human judgment call around around what's good or not. Absolutely. And I also wanted to highlight um, Munch and CapCut. So I learned these two from you as well. And both of these being more towards uh, video editing. And I think that is just such an important um, element of when we're talking about generative AI, how it can be um, a tool in order to take your content that's already existing and take it to that next level. So I know personally from running the High Freight customer community, we get a lot of requests for adding captions to videos. So uh, when I was reviewing this yesterday to you, I was very excited to learn about CapCut because then we're able to add captions more seamlessly. So we're going to experiment with that. And then Munch for video editing as well. So I know in the chat, we're seeing some community managers who are talking about, hey, we're a team of one or two, how can we scale this? And this is what uh, Todd and I really want to highlight is that a lot of these tools can be utilized um, to help you uh, kind of have this whole army <laughs> of yeah. uh, additional workers who can help you scale much more easily. Does that resonate with you, Todd? Because I know at Clock Tower Advisors, you were talking about ways that you've been using AI um, in that same way. Yeah, no, I think it definitely does. Uh, CapCut is great. It was recommended by a great friend of mine, uh, Carolyn Zick of Bad Axe Enterprises, and she is absolutely amazing and a, a great social media expert uh, in, her, in her own right, uh, in addition to her expertise around community building. Um, I, if I could, I'm seeing some questions in the chat around um, just sort of basic definition of community and community building. And, and I, I feel like maybe we should take a step back and address that uh, just briefly. Um, what, uh, and I think, you know, Tim Anderson is asking a great question. What, you know, when you're talking about community or community building, are you talking about it? This is sort of a broad term because community is a much maligned, much misunderstood term. You, you talk to, to, Anyone who's not a community manager specifically is their job title about community, and they get a lot of different notions running through their head ar around what that means. And so for some people, that idea of community could be my uh, my Twitter community or my following on YouTube or people that are that are Instagrammers, you know, you know, following me. I'm generally not thinking of it in precisely those terms, but I do want to be really clear that community is not the platform that it happens to be sitting on. Um, Hivebright is a platform, but your overall community are the people that choose to, to interact there, as well as in all those other social media platforms or other spaces where you have interactions with them. Um, what I think about generally, though, is that the online community platform itself that many organizations will invest in, such as what you know Hivebright offers, um, is it, be, it becomes a commons area for those conversations. The people that are talking out on other on other social media channels are your community, um, but you want to draw them into 
a safe space, like a, like a high break platform where they feel a little more comfortable, a little more safe, sharing more about themselves, about what they care about, what they want to do. And the, the, the idea behind community building is to create trust around that space at the platform level. This is a safe place for me to go. It's more of a private space for me to have conversations with others who have the same interests as me at the, uh, at the company level. Um, where as a company, if I'm running an online community, I'm being transparent about my reasons for doing this. And at the person to person level, I trust the benevolence and good nature of the other people that are coming into this space for me. So just wanted to clarify that because I think it's an important point to make. Um, I, if you want to think of it as a metaphor, I like the idea of the Nautilus shell with the many chambers, but you want to get people to the center of that space. Oh, I love that metaphor so much, Todd. And thank you so much for jumping in there. And what a great question too is, um, so would you say, Todd, that AI, how do you see AI helping overall with this? And we'll go, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, jump forward in our next slide so we can highlight your resource that I think really kind of sets the stage for when we're talking about community in this particular context. So not this um, oftentimes, like you said, community tends to get that misnomer of community is all social media. It's all of these different platforms. We're talking about bringing members more inward on a platform like Hivebrite. Um, and I know that your guidebook talks about how to start using this, uh, how to use AI in this context. So I'd love for you to kind of walk us through at a high level what this guidebook is about. Yeah, exactly. And and I think it, maybe Logan, Logan will be kind enough to put the, the link to that up there. Um, it does ask for an email address, but I promise not to abuse that for anybody. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll only send you cool stuff uh, on occasion if I have something that I want to share. Um, but it's this is basically a, a PDF that I put together as I started exploring uh, some of the tools and resources that are available for community building. And my, um, my focus around this was, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I want stuff that I can use right now uh, that I can start to use. Like, I don't care about vaporware. I don't care about things that are being developed at the beyond the bleeding edge of what AI technologies are capable of. I know there's a lot of cool stuff that's out there and that's coming down the road. But what I care about right now is what I can leverage in my day-to-day -day work. And that becomes things like um, helping me to write prompts or helping me to um, analyze content on a given discussion, um, helping me to write policies um, or guidelines for a community, um, helping me to create a video or other kinds of interesting content um, that I can share in that space. Um, so those are the kinds of things that that went into you know building this. It's a short guide. It's only about eight or nine pages, and uh, and it includes, in addition to a listing of those tools and links to them. Uh, it also uh, offers some uh, ideas for prompts uh, for tools like uh, ChatGPT and and the many others that are like them. Um, and I, I will mention you. You'd ask me for favorites. I I had a lot. All of my favorites are actually in this uh, list. Yeah. Uh, the one that I didn't reference on the previous page that I like a lot, um, but I've had a little bit of a love hate relationship with, is um, perplexity. Um, I don't know if you've uh, I don't know if you've seen Perplexity, but um, it is a Google uh, or it's, sorry, it's a Chrome plugin. Uh, I think it probably exists in some other places as well. Um, but it is kind of like a co-pilot uh, that lets you search for things either on the open web or on the website that you happen to be on or on the page that you happen to be on. Uh, so if you wanted to summarize a discussion, if you're on a uh, if you're on a uh, discussion forum thread, for example, and it provided that it's an open platform, Perplexity can read the conversations that are on a given thread and give you the bullet points. And if you've got a good prompt for it, you can give it a prompt like summarize, summarize the discussion here. And you know, if it's a complex discussion, you can say, tell it to me like I'm five years old, right? And, and it can give you sort of the bullet points out of that. Um, if, if you go to a website and you're looking for general information, and I've used this a lot, um, I have a couple of customers that, that use a, a, a community platform and they have a knowledge base on their main website. I could go to hivebright.com and assuming you've got 
lots of product documentation on your site. I could just ask my question in perplexity about what I'm looking for, and it will actually sift through the entire website and give me the most likely places where I could look for my answer rather than even just going through the basics. Yeah. Nice. And Todd, I think we do have a slide coming up with some of your prompt examples. So oh, let's go ahead and we'll go to the next slide and just wanted to highlight too, and we'll be sure to, I'm seeing questions in the chat about getting access to Todd's PDF. Yes, it will be. The link will be included in our follow-up email and this deck will be included as well, where you'll be able to access this link. So this is AI Encyclopedia, or I'm saying that a little, I'm saying it more uh, straightforward, I think. Encyclopedia, uh, and it's a great source of information um, for all things AI. And they just dropped their first weekly newsletter uh, today, actually. Um, and so they track AI and in the AI space. So if you're curious about legislation or you're curious about the societal impacts of AI um, and more of those deeper questions that we also naturally have as community builders, um, this is a really great resource as well. Um, so we just want to touch on that. So let's go ahead and move forward to enhancing member experience and engagement. And Todd, this next slide is um, going to be focused on supercharging content creation. So there we go. Um, and these are the prompts that you were uh, referencing. So I took the first three just as a teaser. Um, yeah. And I wanted to you know, talk to you about um, when you were first experimenting with AI, um, how you came around to the prompts that you are suggesting in this PDF? Um, and also, what have you found works best? Uh, what are your key takeaways? All of the things uh, with prompting, because it really, truly, so far, for me at least, has been um, a uh, trial and error type of learning experience. Um, sure. The big advice I can personally give is that you have to experiment with the prompts and see what works. Um, and for each community, your prompting is going to be a little different, most likely, in order to get something that's more unique and more representative of your community. So over, you, over to you, Todd, with all of the insights that you've been able to gather while building out this prompt list. I think I think that's a that's a, a terrific introduction to the to the topic, Morgan. And uh, yeah, we're all learning uh, what these are. And I want to be you know fully transparent here. Many of the prompts um, that I've included here um, were drawn from a variety of sources. I am I am shameless at stealing, but I, I did include a bibliography uh, at the end of the PDF that has links to um, the sources for for some of the things that I was able to find. Some of them are original uh, that I, I came up both come up came up with on my own. Uh, but uh, I think some some of these ones here. Um, actually showed up pretty early, I would say, in discussions about community and AI. Uh, and I believe these ones came from David Spinks, uh, who was with CMX uh, at the time. I think he's more of an independent these days, uh, but a brilliant guy. And um, he started playing around with these tools right away around the same time that I did and had uh, an example post. I think you probably can probably find the original uh, post up on LinkedIn um, with him talking about playing with AI. But uh, asking it to generate a guide to building online community, um, he had some other really uh, nice ones like, um, "Hey, I, I've got this community about uh, fire firefighters uh, in the Midwest, and um, uh, help me to come up with uh, a workshop uh, agenda for a two-day workshop on uh, you know on, for this community." And uh, ChatGPT is pretty brilliant at coming up with that, with that, uh, or coming up with uh, ideas for guests uh, who you could bring into your your community space. Um, so it's it's actually uh, pretty pretty brilliant at doing that. Um, and uh, I know Christopher Ragland uh, mentions it's important to give specific details in the prompts. Absolutely. Um, also, it doesn't hurt to ask uh, ChatGPT to critique your prompt. Um, how can I make this a better prompt? Uh, I've, I've seen some of that self-reflexive, you know, kind of approach, you know, working really nicely. Um, if you are using a paid version of ChatGPT, um, I think there is a uh, there is a plugin called Prompt Perfect that'll help you kind of like revise, you know, and, and have the best version of your prompt possible. And um, yeah, and, and there are a lot of people that are uh, pretty good about uh, about that. If you if you ask uh, ChatGPT for coaching, if you can say be be my prompt coach. How can I make write better prompts? It will give you a primer of saying, uh, hey, you know, suggest a role for me. Tell me what to do. Like uh, be my SEO expert. 
be my community management assistant, be, you know, and I've had a lot of luck with that. And, um, and I do notice a difference between the chat GPT 3.5 and the four version and how they, and how they work. Um, I've, I've really had a, uh, a lot of luck. <clears throat> For example, I get really annoyed uh, with chat GPT 3.5 because it tends to write like a, like some kind of marketing person and <laughs> no, no knock on that, but like it can get really salesy and really hypey uh, in, in the way that it writes things. So I'll often tell it as part of the prompt to say like, look, I'm looking for a straightforward, casual, funny storytelling tone, stay away from salesy language. Do not give me over overhyped adjectives. You know, if you give me these things, I'm going to tell you to revise it again, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure does, does no good for me to write that in the prompt, but it, it feels, you know, it's like yeah. <laughs> emotionally satisfying for me to, to add that and probably sort of like, okay, stupid human. Uh, but, uh, but, but to, to be able to offer it sort of like your preferences for style is really important. And particularly if you're, if you're using the chat GPT for this, and I think that's going to very soon be available, I think, to everybody as they continue to upgrade these these language models. Um, it can do some really good things. So for example, um, one of the roles that I've really liked using has been telling it to act as my no-nonsense acerbic writing coach. And I want you, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you uh, writing samples of things that I'm working on. I want you to suggest to me what's wrong with what I'm doing. Don't pull any punches and, mm -hmm. you know, really coach me through this. And it's like talking to an, an old hard bitten journalist uh, when, when it replies back to you, like, so it, it does a good job of that. Um, nothing wrong with asking it to uh, write, you know, write something in the style of somebody else so that it sort of adopts some of the, some of those things. So you can have some fun. I've from time to time, I've told it to uh, write a, write, write me a post in the style of Hunter Hunter S. Thompson, uh, you know the uh, the the Gonzo journalist, and so it would it would give me yeah. some pretty cool stuff, you know, with that, and it was kind of fun. Um, so th I mean, I, I think as people are saying in the chat here too, you've got to experiment with it, you've got to challenge it a little bit, and hopefully it uh, it produces the things you want. But the nice thing about the chat based nature of GPT is you can keep asking it to revise until you get the results that you like. Absolutely. And before we move on, I just want to say too, one thing that I've found that cuts it down on my prompting time uh, will be that I kind of set the stage for the chat bot. So what I'll do is say, hey, chat, I'm currently working on X, Y, Z. These are, this is my goal of working on this project. And here's what I hope to achieve. Please ask me up to 20 questions, for example, of mm -hmm. what you need to know in order to help me achieve this. And this will give me all of the questions. That way it kind of cuts down on that back and forth that you might be experimenting as you're learning to prompt. Um, so it's much more front loaded, but I've found that it kind of uh, boosts my efficiency over time. So wanted to share that as well. I love um, that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, let's go ahead and Todd, I made a whole slide on this because you blew my mind yesterday uh, with plugging into Bing. And I would love for you to talk uh, about what you shared with Logan and I and how you're using Bing to help you identify maybe missing parts of public pages and also upskilling frequently asked questions. So would you mind sharing that anecdote that you shared yesterday? Yeah, this is fun. And so this is uh, this is a little something that I, uh, I picked up from a YouTuber. And uh, if you if you guys are into AI based news and tools, um, I, you know, I'm not a paid shill for this guy. Like I, I, I just like his stuff. Um, a gentleman by the name of Matt Wolf, uh, W-O-L-F-E, uh, does uh, like a weekly roundup of AI-based tools and things that are there. And he, and he covers a lot of stuff, but he, he regularly looks at uh, ideas around uh, great prompts, you know, for either image generation or, or text generation. And, uh, and I, I grabbed this one from him and have applied it to my website and you could apply it to your community as well. Um, you, you can tell uh, Bing or you can turn on Bing in ChatGPT and say, look at this website, give it the link to your website. Um, based on this, um, what kind of questions would a customer or you could say what a potential community member or what a community member have about, about this site? And 
Bing will go and look at all the pages of your site and we'll formulate a list of questions for you uh, that, uh, and they're, they're pretty good. Uh, it'll come up with like 10, 20 questions about, about your site. And then you can say, okay, help me to write answers to these based on the website. And it will basically build an FAQ section for you that you can add, you know, pretty easily and quickly. I'm sure you're going to want to change it and make sure that it's factual. Uh, but, uh, but that's, that's definitely a time saver in my book, uh, being able to do that. Um, I'm also finding that uh, you can you can have Bing look at your your website or an article or articles that you share with it and ask it to write things in your writing style. Uh, so it's pretty good about picking up your own style. Oh, I love that so much. And I see in the chat that we're sharing stories about other writing styles. Someone uh, shared that they've had uh, the chat write. Um, as a joke, a document built as a pirate. Uh, so at the end of the day, the pirate tone was closer to the way that locals speak in uh, in the initial. Uh, so they had to pick out some R's and some mateys, but it ended up being a pirate doc and community facing as well. Thank you, Chad, for sharing that story. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whether it's your own copy voice or a pirate, I've also seen folks uh, write it in the voice of Carrie Brad. Shaw from Sex in the City. There's so many different voices that you can uh, create community content for, especially around um, one of my favorite hacks for this is looking at your community engagement calendar. And let's say your community does observe um, National Pirate Day. Um, so Chad, on National Pirate Day, you can elevate that piece, turn it into an evergreen piece of content, um, and encourage your members to be speaking uh, with mateys and lots of eyes as well. <laughs> um, so Todd, as we're moving through uh, this discussion, next is kind of the, I think, one of the biggest things that we're thinking about when it comes to AI, um, and it's making data-based decisions. And uh, before we jump into this. Um, I know we were talking kind of about the three points yesterday about when you're making decisions. Um, and of course, we just want to uh, say we're going to talk about data first, and then we'll start diving into um, addressing concerns and uh, caveats that come to working with AI. So without further ado, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. And we'll kind of outline for you all about when you're making data decisions with AI, what are those best practices? First and foremost is to define, um, make sure that you have your clear objectives and metrics. So this connects to kind of the webinars we've been having throughout the year. Um, and the key part being is that you want to make sure that you have your established goals and performance indicators before you're asking chat or any other AI a tool to define that for you. Of course, it's a really great brainstorming buddy and they can help you in that direction, but without you determining your North Star or what you want your community to be about, it's going to be really difficult to prompt that out of a um, AI module. Um, next is determine those metrics. So just make sure it's relevant to your goal. Uh, the next core pillar is collecting and analyzing the relevant data. And I know we've been having this conversation in the chat, but um, when you're uh, when you're gathering your sources of data, um, such as user interactions and social media uh, analytics, you can use AI to uh, process this and uncover patterns and trends and correlations. But again, it's not going to be uh, the one to put it in context of your community or in context of your organization. So think of it as your co-pilot, as your buddy, helping you uh, achieve uh, that pattern recognition or the trends more quickly. And then last but not least is validating and interpreting. And Todd, I know you talk a lot about this in your guide about the caveats. And I think this kind of teases up perfectly uh, to move forward. But um, the two key points being, we wanna make sure we're verifying the, ac the accuracy and reliability of what the AI has generated. And then also consider making that additional uh, contextual factors um, with your own expertise, your own experience within your community. So when we're talking in this latter half of this presentation, keep these three parts in mind, um, because once again, AI is still growing, community building in and itself is still growing. And so we have to kind of hold these two truths at once. Yeah, no, I, I I think you're raising some great issues here, and and it, it is important to me, and I I'm seeing this come up as a theme in the in the chat as well that's uh, that's going along with us here 
um, especially some really brilliant things from uh, Kari or Kari uh, Lippert. Um, thanks for for your thoughts and ideas there. I, I think you know the importance of uh, work. You know, when you're working with AI to do any kind of data interpretation or data work, is uh, the old watch uh, watchword of trust but verify. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that uh, yeah, I, I want to believe that these are interesting and good things, but I better darn well verify it before I before I move forward with publishing this information, and I need to be transparent about the sources of where this thing is coming from. Um, going back to what I was saying a little bit earlier in, a, in our conversation around like the levels of safety and trust um, in any kind of community building you're doing, if you're using AI-based tools to create content, to interpret data, um, I think it's important to be intellectually and morally honest about the things that you are that you're producing. Um, you know, within that space, when I'm working with working with customers and I'm using AI-based tools to interpret or collate information from interviews, for example, um, I am absolutely disclosing to them that, hey, I'm using these tools. And um, and I, I, I really, like for me, the thing I've learned today is I love uh, Carrie's uh, uh, citation approach. Uh, it makes total sense. It's like in the way that you access any kind of website, um, what is the tool, uh, you know, the company, the version and the date asked and what the prompt was that was used to get it. That's really great. I think that that's that's nice transparency um, to be able to use. So um, so absolutely, um, you know, some some things around that that we need to be sure of. Um, I will mention just because we're talking about the data side of things, if you're using Chat GPT to crunch any numbers, don't trust those numbers. It's not it's not good at counting. Um, the uh, the only way to to get it to be better with something like that is to use a plugin for it called uh, Wolfram Alpha. Uh, which is far, far better at number crunching. Uh, but you still want to, even so, you still want to uh, crunch crunch that information. Um, Be very wary of numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. AI is not good at uh, at drawing hands, apparently, like for generative images, and it's not good at math. <laughs> <laughs> we're still we're still working those kinks out. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Okay, so not to cut off conversation, Todd, so want to keep flowing with what you're saying with um, the privacy and security with numbers in general, there's kind of these hiccups and caveats, I love the way that you framed this in your workbook, um, with the caution and caveat you have to hold when you're working with AI. So like you said, numbers up at the top, you're not going to want to be focusing or on, on uh, chat GPT to be crunching your budget for the year. Um, and I would love for you to kind of walk us through the four caveats that you, um, you highlighted in your PDF. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as you say, the, the data going into chat GPT, you need to be careful about what you feed it. Uh, OpenAI, as much as I like them as a company, has not been super forthcoming so far around how they are protecting data, uh, which has led to things like Italy saying, no, we forbid anybody from using chat GPT you know, in, in their space. Uh, so, so thinking about um, the privacy of your company's data, anything proprietary, anything deeply personal, um, you probably want to leave out of you know putting into these systems. Like anything on the internet, it can be hacked, and chances are it probably will be at some point. Um, so thinking about the security of that information, especially like I work with organizations that um, have uh, sensitive, personally identifiable information from people and you don't want to include that information. Like you, if you're going to have uh, an AI analyze any of that stuff, you better take steps to anonymize it uh, to the extent that you can. Um, also bear in mind that um, these, these large language models, these generative AI tools uh, are biased uh, because they're based on the data that they look at um, that's there. And that includes you know, racial, ethnic, uh, sexual orientation biases, all of the worst things that make up humanity in many cases can end up influencing the a, the AI uh, algorithms um, that are that are in there. So bear that in mind, and you may need to apply correctives to these things. It's one of the reasons why I think a lot of the early chat experiments uh, from Microsoft and others, um, people would get in and start testing the the language model, and those language models would start to say racist things um, that uh, just you know are are highly problematic for any kind of tech based system. 
Um, yeah. So I, th I think uh, ChatGPT has done a fairly good job, and I say that with big quotation marks around it, uh, about trying to cut off those some of those biases. But um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a caveat. It's yeah, yeah, and I think the um, interesting thing too about what you're highlighting, Todd, is that similar to when building a community, you have to be aware of bias. Um, and so in these large language models, we're not pulling this information from thin air, rather it's this accumulation of information who, that is primarily created by other humans um, that are going to have biases baked into this. And so when you're seeing this at a large scale language model, it's important to keep in mind um, topics that you're asking it about and what the biases around that topic might have. So I know early on in those chat GPT days, like you were saying, there was a lot of bias uh, originally, and I haven't tested it recently with chat GPT, um, but around uh, gender expression. And so um, just bear this in mind when you're working with um, the AI, especially for folks who are working in advocacy spaces or in, in spaces that you have a marginalized group that it needs representation, just to make sure that you're not um, taking chat GPT at its word and uh, accidentally uh, perpetuating a bias. So that's an important flag. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, I'll, I'll mention because we're talking about data here and some of the data biases. Uh, some of the questions in the chat are around getting data into platforms for analysis. Um, so, what can I use to upload three interviews and ask AI to pull out common themes? Well, chances are there's there are limitations on how much data uh, can be put into these platforms at a given time. So, for example, with ChatGPT, it talks about um, a maximum of four thousand and ninety six tokens for a single prompt. That doesn't equate to characters. Um, it has to do with like the overall input um, into the system. So to do something like what you're suggesting, Rebecca, it would take like probably several different inputs and then asking it to go back and, and kind of look at look at all of those at once. Um, I, I think those token numbers are going up um, that as, as these platforms are developing, they're getting better at taking more and more input. Um, but, uh, you know, taking multiple sources in is an interesting animal and, and even getting like a data in a Google sheet examined. I, I know that Google is rolling out some tools for data analysis and that, that some Google tools will, uh, be able to apply, um, some of, some of the analysis, uh, directly from within the Google suite of products, uh, for example. So that was, that was Stephanie's question. Um, but yeah, there, there are definite limitations on that. I will mention one other tool that I've been using for content creation is called content at scale.com, uh, uh, which can take multiple source document inputs and create completely original plagiarism free. They, they promise 100%. And I put no stock in that, uh, <laughs> so you, you know, again, trust, but verify, um, <laughs> Uh, but they can create like long form blog entries uh, based on just you giving it a URL or uploading a PDF or giving it several uh, documents as resources for it. That's incredible. I'm definitely going to check that one out too. Um, so, you know, Todd, I think for the bot, the latter half of your um, cautions and caveats, anything you want to touch on with misuse of AI generate, generated content and ensuring human oversight? Yeah, no, I'll just say like a, a quick anecdote about misuse of AI generated content. It, it, I think it's absolutely possible to misuse it. Uh, I, um, I, I am a, a long time tabletop game hobbyist. And uh, as, as part of what I do for that, you know, putting together role playing games would be I've sometimes sometimes I've asked chat GPT to be the villain um, in a piece that I'm writing and I'm telling it to act, you know, very Machiavellian and, you know, take the negative view of anything that, that, that is put in there. And, um, and it, it, it's made me realize as I've going, been going through that, like, there are some real world bad actors that could do some bad things about like persuasive content that is uh, covering over factual information or reinterpreting things in a way that uh, that is manipulative to people. Um, I think we need to be wary of, of those kinds of misuses of the platform um, and really just ensuring that there's always human oversight for this. This is not, 
as much as somebody could create a fully automated online community uh, managed by a chat bot, I don't think that would be an advisable thing. I think that um, the going forward value of having AI-based tools in our tool set is that they become a partner that we work with that um, helps, us with, helps us with a lot of the things that were previously very odious, repetitive, difficult tasks, uh, just in terms of assimilation and the amount of time that we have to put into it and the emotional labor that goes into it. That's what they're really good at. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself, Todd. Um, thank you so much for taking us through the cautions and the caveats that come with building with AI. And we have about 10 minutes left. So let's go ahead and see what questions we have in Q&A. So for folks who are tuned in, please feel free to continue adding questions either in the chat or in Q&A so we can make sure we get to it. Um, so Todd, I'm going to uh, do some rapid fire for you. Um, and we'll start and kick off with the question that that we got uh, when we first started our meeting, which is from an organizational perspective, how can we ensure personal accountability to work do, uh, to the work that is done established? Uh, it wasn't me that wrote it, it was the robot. So sort of <laughs> what we were just talking about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't think you can dodge it that way. I, I think that if you're using AI-based tools, um, you are responsible. You're you're the adult in the room. Think of it. Think of your AI, uh, your AI copilot as uh, a talented intern who you are responsible for guiding. If the intern wrote something bad and it created bad consequences for your organization, it's probably not the intern that's ultimately responsible for that. It's you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I absolutely love you are the adult <laughs> in the room. Absolutely. Okay. So our next question is, I heard about the trick of using three hashtags. So three pound symbols to distinguish the inputs slash outputs from instructions. When you write prompts in chat GPT, do you have any, do you by any chance know about this? And I understand this might be too tacky of a question, so please skip if you're relevant. But I think that might be something you know about, Todd. You know, I wish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so you you scooped me on this question. Now, I I'm not aware of this, but I'm going to be looking it up uh, right after this uh, right after this call. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll go ahead and I'll paste that in the chat too, uh, so folks can see it. Um, and you know, this is a perfect example of we're constantly learning more about ways that we can be better utilizing it. So thank you so much for uh, giving us that answer oh, or question rather. Okay. So next is if you had to pick one AI tool to start with, which would it be and why? Uh, I mean, chat GPT, uh, start using the free version of the tool chat three chat GPT 3.5, which is the default version you get with a free account is so worth doing because I think we're at a point right now, like if you if you take nothing else away from this, if you are AI tool curious, this is the starting place and this is the place where you can start to learn how to write good prompts. And I think that is the skill over the next couple of years that uh, I think that all of us are going to be developing. All of us are going to be thinking about um, a lot more constantly. And um, I think that this is the time, like we're we're so early uh, in all of this. Uh, this is a playground stage that we're at. And what I vehemently believe is this is the time to play before it gets really serious. Uh, and the, the more that we start practicing and piloting um, some of these tools personally and for our organizations, um, the better prepared we're going to be as a workforce um, going forward. Absolutely. And I think we discussed this briefly yesterday, Todd, but it reminds me of when um, when Canva first kind of came onto the community scene. And at that time, we hadn't had a platform that other than Adobe Photoshop was really accessible to community teams. And so at first there was a little bit of this hesitancy, um, but the community builders who jumped right in, learned the skills really quickly, were then the ones who are helping to lead the space in community building with digital creation with Canva. Now it's kind of similar here where if you're experimenting and you're learning how to prompt early on, you're going to be able to uh, very quickly catch up to Todd and I with saying, okay, this is prompting as it was in June, 2023. 
Um, and a year from now, this is all of the things that I've learned. So it's not too late, jump right in and start experimenting. And we have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Claudia says, um, something I struggle with a lot is managing my community's user generated content. I do it by hand to this day, but I want to find out a way to get an AI tool to help me out. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, totally. Per perplexity that I mentioned earlier, get get the plugin. Uh, if you're using a Chrome browser, I think they, they probably also got it uh, for others. But you can set it to look at uh, and summarize uh, the discussions on a page and, uh, and, and use it to kind of get sort of a bullet pointed uh, output of sort of what's on there, especially if you're trying to get your arms around a large amount of content or a, or a long thread. Uh, that I found to be really useful um, to, to do that. And as far as uh, I, I'd have to dig a little bit more into getting a way to help the, to, to get AI to help me out, um, if that means um, writing responses or moderating, like I think my recommendations for tools would probably be different based on what you were trying to do. Um, you know, so I would, I would probably be, I would be le leaning heavily on chat GPT, um, uh, perplexity and for, for moderating purposes, uh, you know, looking into something like check, check step on to do. Absolutely. And Claudia, just for off of the top of my head, and we'll include this in the follow-up email, we'll have lots of good links for you all, um, is taking a really basic content calendar um, and then start mapping it out, like Tom is saying with chat GPT. So kind of front loading um, mm -hmm. that user generated content really early on and helping you stay organized at a high level. Um, so we'll share a template for that as well. Um, so some other questions that are coming in, and we have a couple minutes left, is, uh, Todd, do you have any um, sense of a AI tool that helps upload audio notes? So an audio recording off the top of your head and can then um, Yeah, I mean, I would probably end up doing some kind of speech to text uh, transcription. Uh, so even using something like rev.com's machine learning uh, way of, uh, you know, pulling audio into, into a document and then getting it into AI for analysis um, kind of work. I'm sure there's some specialized tools out there. Um, and I certainly don't know about them all. I, I would point you to a, uh, another great website called uh, futuretools.io. Um, it's run by, I think that self-same Matt Wolf, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, that is a pretty comprehensive site uh, for finding uh, all kinds of AI tools for different use cases. I'm sure that there are some interesting ones in there for accessibility. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I think this will be our last question, Todd, and it's a little lengthy and I am absolutely loving it. So bring it. Sure do. <laughs> um, so someone has said, if someone uses chat GPT and a Socratic method going through several, going through several back and forth iterations of communicating and refining outputs from chat GPT, and as a result, that person spends pretty much the same amount of time on the task as the person would have if they spent spent on the task, would it count as that person's work or the AI's work? I ask the same questions to professors at my organizations and their answers are mixed. So for folks, I'll go ahead and drop this text into the chat so everyone can see it. Um, but ultimately, uh, what this question is asking, Todd, is if you're using the AI bot as a partner, as a thought partner, working through your work, what is your personal opinion on, um, on this kind of gray area so far with what you've seen in the industry? Yeah, I, I as far as what the industry thinks of it, I have no idea. Uh, but I, I view it as a collaboration. I, I mean, you're, you're. I mean, we're using a tool, uh, and it's not. It's not as if Chat GPT or any AI-based tool has any personal agency and needs to be credited for its creative input. You know, to a process um, from that perspective. But I think from an intellectual honesty perspective, if you are using uh, it as a as an implement to help you get a better result, um, it should probably be acknowledged as part of your methodology, especially if you're doing something from an academic standpoint, I would say it's gotta be cited um, in an appropriate way. 
Yeah. And I think it was Carrie in our audience who was talking about, you know, putting it in your bibliography, like you did in your work book, Todd, or having it referenced where it makes sense is the best approach. And I'm sure as legislation and our understanding of AI tools continues to uh, grow, so will our understanding of how to cite the work and kind of navigate this gray zone. So thank you so much, everyone. This was a lovely discussion, both in the chat and in our Q&A. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll follow up over email with a survey about this session. Um, and then also with all of the resources that Todd and I referenced. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.